behalf of Platinum Regional, Cornerstone, and Premier Imaging, we are so glad to see a good turnout each and every month. And I will turn it over to Pam Goldberg with Cornerstone. Thank you. He has a Master of Arts and Doctor of Psychology in Clinical Psychology from the Georgia School of Professional Psychology at Argosy University in Atlanta. And he served his internship at Miami VA Medical Center in Miami, Florida. He completed a fellowship at the University of Virginia Department of Adult Neurology in Charlottesville, Virginia. And I would just like to say that I have had the privilege of hearing him speak about this topic before, and it is extremely interesting, and you will go away from this with some information that will help you in your daily life and certainly help, you, help your loved ones as well, because we're probably not the ones forgetting everything. It's somebody else, I'm sure. So thank you so much for your time, patience, and I will turn this over to Dr. Adam McDermott. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words it's too much, and uh, it's a privileged to be here to talk to you about this and I hope that I can educate some of us on some things that uh, isn't very widely known uh, about aging, what is normal about aging and what is abnormal about aging and I kind of wanted to extend it a little bit further into getting into a little bit more detail about dementia, particularly Alzheimer's disease and, and what does it really mean as opposed to just telling you what to look for and what not to look for. So understanding it and then the kind of pillars of Alzheimer's delay. Obviously understanding some memory loss and then going over this term that we use a lot that's a really kind of gray area term called mild cognitive impairment. And we're going to speak about early Alzheimer's, understanding it and then the kind of pillars of Alzheimer's delay. A lot of times this word delay, you see the word prevention and it's just unfortunately not true. And we'll talk about that. Uh, and what we can do to delay the onset of this uh, unfortunate condition as much as possible. So uh, then the first thing we're going to talk about is what is normal forgetfulness and what you can do about it and what is a serious memory problem and again what can we do about uh, serious memory problems. So as we all age obviously some of us we get more forgetful. That's normal. You walk into a room and you're, you say to yourself wait why did I come in here again and and yeah, I, you know, I've, I've done that myself and, and it, it, that's normal. But if you're starting to do that uh, every day, all day, things like that, that could be an indication of something different. You know, uh, as we age, it may take longer to learn new things. It might take more repetitions before it kind of gets a hold on of it. Uh, and remembering certain words, things like that. Those are all parts of normal age-related cognitive decline that we all experience and it can be due to a number of reasons vision problems, hearing problems, uh, and then just certain changes that naturally take place in the brain. So again, what are, the thi what are things that we can do to keep our memory sharp, um, learning new skills, and we're going to talk about more of this in depth later when we're talking about the kind of pillars of delay, but you know, volunteering, spending time with family and friends, keeping a structured environment is one of the biggest things I tell people who think they're having memory problems or are having memory problems and a lot of things that we'll get into like I said later on but exercising and eating well and being fully rested so we're going to get to that more in depth but this is going to kind of touch base on it. So more serious indications of a memory problem is really when it starts to affect your daily life to a uh, significant degree. This is more things of mom or dad or sister or brother who are repeating themselves over and over again. They've, uh, and this could be within a five or ten minute span or half an hour. In any case, if that's happening, happening in more frequency and duration, then that can be a sign of a more serious problem. Having navigation issues while driving, uh, particularly if you start noticing this happening in uh, familiar areas, that can be another indication because that's something that has maybe been so ingrained and now well, what could be causing this uh, inability to um, navigate. Uh, being confused or disoriented to what time it is, the place. Now don't get me wrong, when I'm retired uh, and you ask me what the date is and I don't know, I don't care. But <laughs> if, if you don't know that it's you know Wednesday or that it's 2012, uh, that's more of a serious sign. You know, if you forget that it's Tuesday and say it's Wednesday, I don't care. Um, problems following more complex directions and things like that or performing procedures maybe that someone has done for a long time like operating a television remote or an appliance. Now I can also, I can understand it you now with my grandfather when he gets my, the new controller and it's got 17,000 buttons and he doesn't know how to work it. 
I'm not too worried about them, but you know, uh, using a telephone or a simple uh, phone like that, uh, that can be a sign that something different might be happening. So what do we do about this? I mean, the number one thing, uh, and again, just re you, you go to see somebody. You see your doctor, uh, whether that's your primary care physician to start with or uh, moving on to more of a specialist. Typically, the way I see patients is that they go into their doctor, a uh, regular family physician, and they tell him or her that, you know, something just seems different or a family or friend have been telling me that things seem different. And what likely tends to happen is they send them to some uh, more of a specialist in memory disorders or cognitive disorders, uh, people who deal with thinking skills disruptions. And those would be neurologists and neuropsychologists. So one looking at, uh, we both do a medical service, but one uh, covers one piece of the puzzle and myself covers the other. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth uh, in a minute. And, the biggest thing is to figure out what if any difficulties you're having because we need to know exactly what's causing your memory issue and in if, even in fact if you are having any cognitive issues. So that's how we kind of have a symbiotic relationship between neurology and neuropsychology is to figure out and again put that piece of puzzle together because if we find that something progressive is going, to, is going on or we feel like there is, then there are certain treatments that can be implemented if warranted or if you just need certain compensatory strategies to deal with age-related decline. So cause, just very simply, some causes of serious memory problems. There are lots of things that can unfortunately mess with our brains uh, from blood clots in the brain or strokes emotional factors like depression or anxiety, obviously dementias like Alzheimer's disease, and there's a whole list unfortunately of other dementias that are out there. And just some others is, you know, drinking too much alcohol over an extended period of time, head injuries, any kind of systemic problems like thyroid, kidney, liver, uh, and you can have medication reactions that can cause these sorts of things. So, Say you go to the doctor and they talk to you and they're saying, yeah, you're having these mild issues or you have the testing done. Well, what does this term mild cognitive impairment really mean? Well, I hate the term impairment because I usually tell people it's mild cognitive issues. Now, if you're having impairments, I'll speak to that, but this is really a specific type of memory problem that actually, in fact, doesn't have to always involve memory. Uh, people with this diagnosis or who meet the criteria for this typically show, show more memory loss than what would be associated with aging, and yet they don't show signs of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So symptoms are you typically, from the criteria, you have a memory complaint and some other form of neurological sign or symptom like problems with language, uh, maybe some attention related issues, but it's not to the point where it's really functionally messing with your daily activities like managing medications, finances, driving, uh, performing cooking related activities, things of that nature. So the big question is whenever, if you would change over for me, thank you. Should you be concerned about this if it comes up? And, and the answer to that is sort of yes and no. And at times I'm going to be referring to my cheat seat, <clears throat> my, my memory tool, uh, so bear with me. Um, you know, the research tells us that a percentage of, pe of people, unfortunately, will progress every year to uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And circa 2007, that figure was about 12 to 15 percent. So having this diagnosis or meeting the criteria for this, uh, for this uh, diagnosis is sort of like increasing your risk for developing overt or frank dementia. But and there are individuals that have uh, different thinking skills difficulties that show particular patterns that may not necessarily represent or even ha have memory as being involvement. So uh, those sorts of things, you can meet the criteria for mild cognitive impairment because of cerebrovascular issues, uh, stroke, things of that, and it's not always memory that is, is there. So. Uh, having a neuropsychological evaluation or cognitive testing can help us delineate between, well, does this look like MCI that's going to turn into Alzheimer's disease? Or is this MCI that could be due to cerebrovascular compromise, like a stroke, or changes in the brain that happen over time? So some risk factors for that. 
uh, our age, the older that we get, the more likely we are to develop things like uh, mild cognitive issues or dementia. However, incidentally, we find that once a person reaches a certain age, they're actually protected. And once you reach the age of 85, God bless us all who reach 85, you become sort of protected from that. Um, but the older that we get, the tendency is to be at a higher risk for it. If you have an immediate family member who has a, a type of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, again, that doesn't mean you're going to get it. It's, again, increasing your risk for developing the pathology. And this APOE4 gene, which I'm not going to pronounce out for you because when I forget what it is, and it, no, it's just a polypopalopalopoly, and uh, it's a gene that we know uh, is specifically linked to, again, increasing your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Okay? So uh, there are genetic tests for that. Um, it's not readily available. It's not, not something that we do clinically, that a neurologist comes in, because, again, it's not, li it's not uh, ne necessary that to do that kind of testing because you're going to put people in a place and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to get uh, Alzheimer's disease, I have this gene, and that's not necessarily so. Plus that can lead to emotional factors which can mimic cognitive dysfunction as it is. So it's not highly done, but it is there. Uh, some controllable risk factors for developing uh, cognitive issues and dementia are having high stress, nutritional status, cardiovascular disease. What we know is that uh, epidemiological studies tell us that people who have long-standing things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, and God knows I got to practice what I preach when I talk to my patients about, you know, keeping, maintaining weight, uh, good weight that is, um, that they are more predisposed to developing this because the more changes or abnormal changes in the brain that go on, uh, that increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease pathology. So I want to talk a little bit about, okay, well, we've been talking about MCI, we've been talking about Alzheimer's disease, and a lot of times people come in and they, they really go, well, you know, do I have dementia or do I have Alzheimer's disease? And I go, well, that's a fantastic question uh, because what is the difference? What is the meaning of one versus the other? And the way to really think about it is dementia is this umbrella term. And all the kind of spokes underneath it are things that can cause dementia. Okay? Alzheimer's disease is unfortunately only one of, like I was saying earlier, several different types of dementias that are out there. Uh, things like Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia. I could have a slide, you know, going the whole way down to the first floor on the different types of dementias that you can develop for multiple reasons. It is, however, the number one cause of dementia, and the second cause, most likely cause, used to be vascular, meaning you had a stroke, but it's actually Lewy body dementia. And how many people have heard about Lewy body dementia? It's a couple, maybe a couple people, but the majority of people have never even heard of this. And the thing about being educated on the different types of dementias, which I'm not going to get into in this lecture, uh, might be something for the future is, you know, well, how do I know uh, if I have one versus the other? Because a lot of these other ones actually have different symptoms that might present initially before things like Alzheimer's. The typical pattern for Alzheimer's, which we're going to go over, is the first thing we see is memory problems. But that's not always true for the other types of dementia. So just for example, frontotemporal dementia, uh, particularly what we call the behavioral variant, the person may have behavioral or personality changes. And maybe some mild cognitive issues, but everything else seems intact. So you can see how that's the important process of going through differentiating what's going on so we know best how to treat it. So here's the criteria right now, uh, the more advanced criteria as opposed to uh, what we use in psychology and psychiatry that they've come up with to diagnose uh, Alzheimer's. And it's dementia, meaning a decline in memory and other cognitive functions in the absence of impairment of, unconscious, of, of uh, consciousness. So that would be something like a delirium where someone is kind of rapidly having uh, systemic issues and it could be due to metabolic changes. Um, could be due to a number of other things. As we age, a lot of people, uh, uh, elderly people, can get urinary tract infections, and then all of a sudden they have uh, delirium and they get diagnosed with dementia. But 
The dif difference between delirium and dementia is that once you treat the underlying cause of delirium, it goes away, your cogn cognition comes back, your thinking skills return. You need areas of, uh, two areas of deficit in cognition, very similar to mild cognitive impairment. So we want two areas, uh, uh, either, or either uh, progressively worsening by tr tracking the trajectory of it or by subjective complaint and the onset being between 40 and 90. So you can see how much we know about that in terms of uh, uh, when the diagnosis is, uh, the onset of it is because it can be so variable and most often it's after age 65. Um, and then again, be any kind of other medical thing that could be going on which could be accounted for by the confirmed cognitive issues on neuropsych testing or mental status exams and things of that nature. So here's where we get into some lovely pictures that uh, if you look on the Alzheimer's disease website, they might find some very similar ones that I stole, uh, borrowed, <laughs> and uh, I won't tell if you don't. They're just the most fantastic ones that I've seen, so I figured why not use them? Uh, they were there. Uh, so what this is showing here is some a Alzheimer's disease caused brain changes. So what happens in Alzheimer's disease is, is the process, the pathology, is causing nerve death, nerve cell loss. And what we're seeing here is the tissue changes between a healthy brain and one with an advanced Alzheimer's disease brain. And you can obviously see how much it's shrinking. Uh, and this is a kind of comparison. You can see, look how far out that's going. That's all brain tissue that you used to have and now you don't have. So you can see that you know, this part of the brain used to do something. It's no longer there. So your brain is not able to perform that function like it used to. Here's another uh, look at it. So this would be if you kind of, I'm not trying to get gross on you here, but if you kind of slice me down through this way and you're looking at the brain and I'm facing you, that side is showing a healthy brain and again a more advanced Alzheimer's brain. And you can see here the atrophy or the shrinkage that's going on. And if you look, you can just see like areas are missing. Uh, these are ventricles that hold cerebrospinal fluid. You can see that they've kind of dilated or expanded out because of all this excess room that's there. So this is where technology like brain MRI scans and things like that can help us to look for structural changes in the brain that may be indicative of something like Alzheimer's. Now obviously if we get to the, we want to catch it way prior to this because this is like I said uh, an advanced uh, Alzheimer's brain picture and early detection is key. So looking under the microscope, Alzheimer's disease brains have fewer uh, nerve or uh, um, nerve cells and synapses than a normal healthy brain and what happens is these plaques and tangles build up in the brain and basically disrupt the electrical system that's going on. So you know, here are some healthy cells, the dendrites and everything, the synapses and then here's this buildup of all these different pathologies that are going on that are disrupting those things. And the plaques are abnormal clusters of proteins and the tangles are made up of kind of twisted strands of other different types of proteins that really kind of work together to really uh, disrupt the thinking skills of people who have this condition. So specifically about the plaques, they're called beta amyloid and what happens is they clump together and they're kind of this sticky clump and they get into the nerve cells again like I was saying and gradually build up into these plaques. So it's kind of like getting all this gum together and, and pulling it all together and they really bind and again that's what's causes the disruption. And what can also happen is that when this is happening, it's like anything else that happens to your body that's, that's foreign or shouldn't be happening. You get an infection, your immune system starts fighting it. So not only do you have this process going on, but it activates the immune system and then your immune system is actually starting to attack those cells that are dying yet it's kind of boosting up that the level of activity of, of uh, or rapidly progressing the, uh, the death of those cells because your own immune system is attacking them. So the tangles here that I'll show you in a moment, uh, they destroy vital cell transportation systems and proteins. So 
what we're seeing in this area is it's kind of like disrupting the, again, the electrical flow because of these healthy areas here. You can see they almost look like tracks and then there's these spots here where the tangles are forming and the tangles inside are killing off the nerve cells and disrupting that flow. So it's kind of like the electrical system in your house if you have a little short in there you know, that's maybe why the light's flickering or it's disrupting the way that some appliance is working. And if you get up, the more and more of those that you have, the more and more difficulties that you can develop. So I kind of want to show you this picture here and we're going to go through one at a time. And this is the sort of uh, typical progression of Alzheimer's disease. And what these uh, blue areas represent are those plaques and tangles, the pathology, between the early stages, the mild to moderate stages, and the more severe stages. So one of the biggest questions that people ask me when they come in is, you know, and I unfortunately diagnose them with what I believe to be probable Alzheimer's, well, doc, how much time do I have? And I kind of just shrug my shoulders and say, I'm not really sure. I can throw statistics after statistic at you, but People I've seen diagnosed with Alzheimer's will go on to live the rest of their lives and die from natural causes. Uh, some people, unfortunately, if it's rapidly progressing, uh, will maintain for three or four years and then it, over, it overcomes them. But statistically, if you wanted a number about after a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, which usually happens in this, uh, in this stage, uh, it's about eight years. But I don't like telling people that because it could be 15 years. It could be four years. That's what we're here for, to follow you along with this journey, to track the trajectory of, your, of any kind of deficits you're having, to really formulate what stage of the disease process you're in. So if you would for me. And the interesting part about this early stage is that it can actually begin 20 years before you have symptoms happen or occur. So the early stages of this, you know, are starting to implicate areas again. This is, uh, I guess I should explain. Now we're looking at a different part of slicing of the brain, straight through this way, and I'm kind of be looking that way, okay? So it's like the middle portion, and this again is an area implicating thinking and, uh, thinking and learning and memory, planning, organization, and things of that nature. And you may not really be seeing a lot of deficits going on at this stage. So at the earliest stages, it could be misconstrued as age-related decline, um, which is why we, you, you know, whenever you first start noticing things, it's best to get checked out. Now in the more mild to moderate stages, memory and thinking are again, you can see the, you know, the con more condensed part here uh, where the hippocampi are. It's a part of the brain that's highly implicated in learning and memory. It starts going further into the frontal part of the brain in thinking and planning. Uh, it starts invading the language areas, even back into areas that uh, can mess with your sense of where your body is in space. So these plaques and tangles are spreading all to these areas and as the Alzheimer's progresses, you can actually start experiencing in this stage personality and behavioral changes. So there are lots of things that can be going on um, besides just the thinking skills disruptions. You can again start seeing some kind of behavior or personality changes. But this usually comes after or along with the cognitive issues as opposed to that type of dementia that I was speaking quickly of earlier. Um, now, Unfortunately, you have the person who's reached the, the severe degree or the more advanced, and you can see the, the cortex of the brain is just lots of blue, lots of, lots of the plaques and tangles forming up everywhere. And this is a person who may have behavioral disturbances, is probably cognitively kind of bottomed out, unfortunately. Um, Medications at this point are not going to really help preserve much because there's not likely a lot to preserve, unfortunately. And the medications that we do have that I'll talk about quickly later are preservative. You know, that's the key word. They're not preventative and they're not curative. So this is a, a person who uh, may very likely need uh, help with basic self-care activities, bathing, grooming, dressing, things of that nature. Uh, we'll almost definitely need uh, assisted living types of facilities or 24-hour care and supervision. That's the point that we've reached. Now, again, it could take 20 years to get to this point or it might not ever get there, but this is the typical progression over time. 
So again, Alzheimer's delay. And again, I say delay because a lot of the times you get these pamphlets. I hand out pamphlets from the Alzheimer's Association and they say Alzheimer's prevention, the pillars of Alzheimer's prevention and things like that. I wish that was true. I wish to God it was true that we had a magical pill and say you take this and you're never going to get it. We're working on it, but we're not smart enough. We're in the process of drugs that are out there and I'll talk about those. Um, but I'm just going to call it how it is. It's really delaying. And these are things that can help you if you're predisposed and say I knew the future that you were going to get Alzheimer's disease. Not to point at you like you're going to get Alzheimer's <laughs> disease. But as an example, you, I can foretell the future and I know you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. These are certain things that we can do to help delay the onset of that. And as you've seen there, there are diet and supplements and things and we're going to go through each one of them. So. A, a lot of this seems almost, you know, just, duh. <laughs> Doing everything mom and dad told us to hopefully do as we were growing up and eating healthy and maintaining a healthy weight. And this is a sort of diet that I found that uh, was recommended and we all need certain fats. Well, there's a difference between uh, Burger King and McDonald's fat and uh, good fat sources like olive oils, uh, flaxseed oils, omega-3s. Those sandwiches are grilled, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Scratch the McDonald's, Burger King, I don't want to... <laughs> um, but see, I, you can have chicken and fish and all that's very good. So lean proteins, because we all need proteins, we all need fats, and we all need good complex carbs. And things like that come from fresh vegetables, legumes, fresh fruits, grains. So you, this is a healthy diet and there are superfoods for the brains out there, or for the brain. Uh, blueberries and spinach are good examples. And the reason that they're really superfoods is because they're high in antioxidants. That's one of the key things is that you have free radicals from breathing in the air, being exposed to natural radiation that's, that's, that's out there. Uh, but uh, things like antioxidants get into your body and help get rid of them. So this kind of diet is again, and it can maintain a healthy lifestyle, maintains a healthy cardiovascular system, and maintains a healthy cognitive system. So here's the other uh, big one that everyone uh, also wants to talk about. And I actually learned a lot from doing, putting together this presentation on this because everyone wanted to come in to me and say, well, what about uh, coconut oil? And what about ginkgo biloba? And I found all these other ones on there, omega-3s, Hooper's, Hooperzine, and things I couldn't even pronounce and I had to look up and I was going, you know, well that makes sense. I, I should be knowing about this. They're asking about it and I knew about some of them. Uh, but the biggest thing is that you really need the science behind it before you can say that this is going to help with your memory. And the biggest thing I'll tell you about all of the above things that I, I found is that there was no statistically significant difference between anyone who took these supplements on research than were taking a placebo. Okay? From coconut oil to you know, ginkgo biloba, there's a few that were mixed, but the other things to consider if you're thinking about this and you have the condition are effectiveness and safety are not regulated or are unknown because they don't study them the same way. They're not FDA approved. And God knows I wish that FDA could approve some good stuff faster, but none of these things, you'll see it right on the bottles. Uh, it says not you know, tested or whatever from the FDA. The purity of these is unknown, so really how much ginkgo biloba are you getting in that little capsule that you're taking? I don't know. It, half the time it doesn't say that kind of thing on there. Uh, and in terms of other drug trials and things like that, they keep track of adverse reactions, side effects and things like that, whereas if you're not doing these phase three or more comprehensive uh, drug trials, then we don't know how many bad reactions are happening. So do 2% of people who take uh, Hooperzine or Ginkgo Biloba develop liver function? I don't know, you see on TV all these drugs out there for like cataracts and it's like could cause liver damage, heart attack, death, stroke. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll live with my cataracts. But, you know, we don't even know if that's there for that because, uh, you know, it's not being tested that way. Plus, these supplements, um, Half the time we don't know how they react with other prescription medications that you might be on. 
A perfect example is uh, people used to uh, take, uh, and they still probably do take uh, uh, St. John's wort to help with your mood and things like that. Well, one, never take any supplement without talking to your physician. That's the number one thing. Uh, but two, if you're on an antidepressant and you're taking St. John's wort, you can have an adverse reaction. You can have uh, serotonin syndrome, it's called, and that's, that's a nasty thing to have and can be life-threatening. So again, before you take any supplement, even things like omega-3s, which I think are actually good, and the reason I think omega-3s three, uh, are particularly good is because not know so much that it's preserving memory, but that uh, it's... Uh, helping with your cardiovascular system and which is also then helping with your cerebrovascular system. So like kind of earlier on, obviously getting those from natural sources is going to be better, uh, but you can get them from certain fishes and everything else like that. But again, there are limitations on doctor's recommendations for things like how much tuna you should eat every week. So keeping those things in mind as well. Stress management. Stress management. I don't know how to manage stress. I'm a psychologist too, and I, it's stre stress is everyone has stress, but it can be a vital part of presenting uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we know that there's a relationship, and I talked, to, I spoke to this a, a little bit earlier, to these uh, cardiovascular risk factors that are also cerebrovascular risk factors, meaning in the brain. Uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high cortisol, which can uh, be related to stress. In fact, all of these can be key factors. Uh, stress can be the etiology of uh, a lot of these things. You know, if you go to the doctors and you're not really keen on going to the doctors like I am, you know, I go in there and my blood pressure is 150 over 90 and they're going, what's going on? I'm like, I'm afraid of you for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but, you know, so you can see the stress that can ha ha have an impact physiologically on you. And, uh, you know, even emotional factors, depression, anxiety, can manifest physically. So we want to make sure that that stress and anxiety particularly is under control. And there are a number of things that you can do. Prayer, massage, relaxation techniques, uh, clinical psychologists, this is some things that they specialize in, anxiety disorders and stress management. Uh, there are lots of things that you can do to manage stress in a healthy, productive way. Uh, and uh, uh, drinking alcohol and, is, and high consumption is not one of them. <laughs> or uh, doing uh, other maladaptive things is not a way to deal with stress. Uh, so stick to things like uh, meditation and so forth. Physical exercise. And again, this is where I need to practice what I preach. Uh, in some studies, it's been shown to reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's by 50%. That's a pretty big, uh, that's a pretty big number. And in fact, um, in fact uh, there are some studies that show, and whenever I, let me back up here. When I have someone who comes into my office and uh, I, I fortunately get to tell them that they have depression and anxiety and they kind of look at me weird and I go, well, let me, let me tell you why I say that. I'm saying that you have depression and anxiety and you don't have Alzheimer's and we can treat this. So uh, physical exercise has been shown in some studies to be almost as, if not as effective, of talk therapy and medications. Plus it's good for emotional adjustment and cognitive uh, functioning. And another study showed that I found uh, from the Alzheimer's disease website is that uh, women who uh, exercise regularly had a dramatic reduction in decline. 40 to 60, uh, from age 40 to 60, had this dramatic de decline in, or uh, reduction in cognitive decline, part of me. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a number of things you can do. Particularly aerobic exercise seems to be the thing that helps the most. Whether that's just walking most days of the week, um, as much aerobic exercise releases all those good endorphins, but you also want to consider strength training. You, you know, you don't want to bulk up to be Arnold Schwarzenegger or anything. I mean, you can if you want to, but you know, what that's going to do is help maintain muscle mass, prevent osteoporosis, um, keep yourself strong, because as you get older, the as a percentage of your muscle mass that tends to decrease over time. So we all need to work harder, unfortunately, as we go over to maintain things so that we don't develop these other risk factors uh, uh, for cognitive decline. And exercise is just, is just a great one to do. So medications. 
so you, you come into my office and, and again, I'm, I'm unfortunately, you know, we've done some neuropsychological testing, we've had to see a neurologist, we've ruled out everything off the table, and we're pretty sure that you have probable Alzheimer's disease. This is just an example of some of the medications that are out there to preserve as much functioning as possible. New medications are always being tested and I want to tell you about a specific one that I was involved in a drug trial with up at UVA. But these are the things that we have right now that are, uh, most of them are uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And there's a certain thing that happens with Alzheimer's disease is that it starts attacking particular cells that, uh, that um, make acetylcholine. And so what this is, does is help to raise that level and hopefully slow down the progression of the disease process. They're again not preventative, they're not curative unfortunately. So early detection at this point is key because if normal Joe is here and he waits to be here to come and see me, that's all we're preserving. So if you have any kind of thoughts, concerns, that you might be having some memory loss, whether it ends up being age related or not, or you knock every test we have out of the park, I'd rather you come in here and if it is something that's going on, we catch it here. I should have made a slide for this instead of this little arm show. <laughs> but because what, and these medications have been shown to preserve functioning in most individuals, like everything else, we're all individuals. We don't react to medications the same. They all have side effects. Uh, most of them don't have any serious side effects, but sometimes people can tolerate them or not. So that's an important part of seeing the specialist, okay? Because I'd rather see you drop a little bit and then plateau for as much as possible. And then once we see decline happening again, boom, we want to throw up more roadblocks. That's the whole point at this point is to preserve as much functioning and quality of life as possible in an individual who has Alzheimer's or other dementias, okay? Now hope is out there for, for uh, the future. Uh, some of the medications that I was on the drug trials with that I didn't even know at the time were uh, actually starting to look at stopping those plaques and tangles from being formed in the first place. So we also have imaging techniques that can show those plaques and tangles, which we never had before. And that could be pre-symptomatic. So imagine if you have this, you know, these, these uh, plaques and tangles that could be building up 20 years before you're even symptomatic, and we give you a scan, or, or we notice that this is going on, and we start treatment or prevention then, if we have these medications that we, that we hope are going to do what they think, that we think they're going to do and stop that, that person may never develop. Whether or not they will work is exactly why they're being tested and they are being tested uh, FDA phase three, meaning uh, higher order uh, stringent testing with thousands of people. And it's my hope that uh, we'll be seeing more of that in the future and they'll be able to help people not only before they're symptomatic, but people who unfortunately are. So, uh, if you would for me. One way I just wanted to talk about before I kind of uh, end for questions is that what, what really is my role in this? So, uh, what I do is perform neuropsychological evaluations and that is to uh, take your subjective report. So, most people come in and, and friends or family or whomever have been telling them, you know, I'm forgetful, I'm having these kinds of issues, and I collect my information, and then we do paper, usually paper and pencil type tasks to help uh, objectively measure your thinking skills compared to your cohort. That's very important. So we want to make the best comparison and say, okay, you're a 75 year old man, you have 12 years of education, I want to find out what your strengths are, where you're performing, where I expect you to be. And are you having any age-related decline? Any reductions beyond that or impairments looking at the nature and severity of them and what we need to do about it, okay? My hope is that with every person that comes through the door that they do fine. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. So the biggest thing to do is to, again, gather all the pieces of the puzzle and that's getting the functional evaluation and then seeing a neurologist for the, the other medical perspective on ruling out any medical things that could be going on, like we mentioned earlier, thyroid problems, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, it's amazing the things that can go on uh, that can be easily reversible. Unfortunately, those, those things that are reversible are more rare 
an occurrence than something like Alzheimer's disease. And the way a neurologist can also assist is again, like I was talking about MRI of the brain, they, I kind of think of it like in the relationship between neurology and neuropsychology, uh, the same way a, 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 car, a cardiologist might think of heart problems. So you go to your cardiologist and you, you may have some issues and they send you for an echocardiogram. Well, that looks at the heart and it looks for structural issues. That's what a brain MRI does. And the neurologist would order that and probably run the labs to make sure there's nothing reversible. Well, then they come to me and I do the functional assessment. Well, that's like the cardiologist sending you for a stress test to see how your heart's functioning. And now we have all the pieces of the puzzle to put together and say, again, where are you, where are you performing very well? What areas might you be having trouble with? And then we come up with a plan for you. So that's our goal. And as a neuropsychologist, my follow-up goal is to track the trajectory if there is, unfortunately, something going on. It's the only way that we can do that because we can look at the brain all we want and it's not always going to tell us how you're functioning. It's not going to tell me how you're able to manage your medications. It's not going to tell me how you're going to be able to pay your bills on time or remember to, to pay them on time or what your risk is at driving if you're having certain issues and things like that. And those are things that I can talk to you about. And, and if you're having some areas of strength, then we can talk about how to utilize those areas to compensate and circumvent some of the, some of the issues that you may be having. So it also, finally, helps with treatment planning because like I said if you come in at a more milder stage and we start you on uh, one of the medications that was just on the previous slide and you get to a point where maybe that medication has run its course with you and I'm following up with you with testing and I notice the decline even though you're on it then I go boom Dr. So-and-so neurologist uh, he or she needs to supplement with this new other medication or other medication that we know works more in maybe the more advanced stages of the disease process. So that's, you can see the, the symbiotic relationship that we have with neurology and neuropsychology and it's right now the best course of action, the best plan we have for people who are again unfortunately uh, suffering from things like Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So. Final note before any questions that you have is uh, the biggest thing, and I said it 20 slides ago, if you're thinking that you have any difficulties whatsoever, I like to be more kind of cautious than anything else. If someone says, you know, I forgot one thing, you know, in my whole life, I'm going to the doctor. Go to the doctor and get checked out. Why not? Why not at least get peace of mind? And if there is something going on, again, the earlier that we can detect it, the more that we're preserving. So anyone who has any issues or concerns, you can call me, you can talk to your PCP about it, um, talk to your neurology friend who lives down the block, but talk to somebody and come up with a plan of action to do. Don't wait until you're down here and mom and dad or your brother or your sister has got so much impairment because that's all we're preserving at that point, okay? So I encourage you, be proactive in your, in your care, be proactive in your health, and I think I've put out some flyers to our memory and aging care clinic. If you ever needed a consult about that, you know, that's a clinic that we started here that works with people who may feel like they're having problems or are already having problems. I'd be more than happy to see you or my colleagues in that clinic uh, and we can talk about maybe what options there might be for you. So I really appreciate you putting up with my, uh, my spiel here. I hope that it was somewhat uh, educational. Uh, and uh, I'm open to, uh, to questions. Uh, if, I, uh, if I can't answer them, I'm sure Google can. <laughs> so. I have a question. Sure. Um, soft drinks, specifically diet soft drinks that have all those butyl chemicals in mm -hmm. it. Has there been any study done on soft drinks and artificial sweeteners and how that could affect your memory? I don't know of any about affecting memory. I incidentally came across something about uh, the stuff in, I forget what, I'm sure it didn't say exactly what the soft drink was, but it, drinking diet drinks actually prevents um, with calories, burning calories. You don't burn as many calories. That's the only thing that I've heard of. So, I mean, if you drink a lot of diet cola, I'm not talking it was saying like you're going to become obese if you, if you drink diet, diet Coke uh, or whatever, but I'd rather you, uh, you know, drink Diet Coke than drink regular Coke because of the sugar and everything else. But it was a small portion. But I, I have never come across anything about a correlation between any of the 
preservatives or other things in, in soft drinks. I mean, there could be, but it's just, I don't know. It, it, my, the office for the Memory and Aging Care Clinic is out of the Westchester building. Oh. It, it, yeah, so it, it's uh, south from here. Uh, we have two neuropsychologists. Uh, I'm primarily the one working with it right now. We've hired on a new fantastic neuropsychologist who will be starting with us in September, who uh, is a friend and colleague of mine actually and was at UVA. So she's going to just come right on board and be jump right into the clinic and we're going to be able to serve more people. Our wait times are going to be dramatically reduced and we're going to be able to help many more people in a shorter amount of time so I'm very excited about it. Uh, we're seeing, my husband has dementia. Mm -hmm. We're seeing uh, one of the neurologists over there concerned about his memory. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point they're saying hey he's okay. I have some real concerns sure. because I've seen a tremendous memory is just not there. Right. So, I need more than just the neurologist. We're on a three-month let's look at Right. You are the one. It's like, you come into my life right now telling me you're the one put it all together because it's like everything's all Yeah. Well, one thing that I would do, and I, in, in every one of my evaluations, and, and in the, the MAC clinic, or Memory and Aging Care Clinic, the MAC clinic I call it, um, I speak to all those things with people I do full, evalu full evaluations with or brief testing in the MAC clinic or if you come in for a psychosocial visit meaning you just need some support. And we have lots of resources and we're just building up new and more resources and one of the things that I specifically speak about is driving. I'll be the bad guy because a lot of times and I'm not saying this about any, any physician or anything else like that but some people don't like to say, you know, you should or shouldn't do anything. Because I don't want to take away anything from you. I want you to live as independently and autonomous as possible. I want you to live in your house as long as possible. But I'm not afraid to say, if you were my mom or dad, or if you were my brother or sister, I'd take your keys. And I don't have the authority, and I don't think physicians in this state have the authority to do it. I think some people can call the DMV and write a letter or something like that. But uh, I talk to you about the risk of it based off of my functional evaluation. So if I did some brief testing, for example, with your husband, and I said, we're seeing some slow thinking, we're seeing some attention-related difficulties, we know there's lots of memory stuff going on, I would say to him probably something like along these lines, you know, you've been driving for 50 plus years, who am I to tell you you can't drive? And you can leave here today and drive, and you may never have an accident but you are at an increased risk at something happening. So let's just take a primary example. You have slow thinking. God forbid you're behind the wheel and a deer runs out in front of you or a person and your reaction time is so slowed and you hit and kill that person. Do you really want to live with that the rest of your life? Now that can happen to any one of us, but because of this evidence that I have, you're at a much higher increased risk of some sort of incident like that happening. And I let that go. And I have materials on, uh, if you uh, ever wanted to come into the clinic for an appointment, I have materials on how to talk to people about driving and when it's time to stop driving. Um, there, I've been looking into formal driving evaluations in the area, but I just haven't found anything yet that I really trusted. I mean, the DMV would do it, but I don't know what the consequences, excuse me, would be from that. Um, and again, you know, but we speak to all those things. Okay. That's helpful because I'm having one happen with that. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll Is there any additional information or any change in the information you give when it's early onset alternatives? Uh, speak to that again. Is there any additional information yeah. when it's early? Yeah. Well, again, the biggest thing to do is, as we we're talking about, to, to delay the progression of it, and that is, again, being on the right medication. That's, uh, that helps preserve it. So say we say we know it. You're talking about we know it's early Alzheimer's. It's it's doing all those things: maintaining a healthy diet, um, li low stress, uh, exercising as much as your physician allows you to do. But again, there's nothing that's going to really prevent this pathology from progressing. All we can do is slow it down. So live the lifestyle factors. Keeping cognitively stimulated is a huge thing. Mentally stimulated. And there's studies that show that. People who keep cognitively stimulated, that can reduce uh, the, the time and progression of things. 
I don't know who to go to first, sorry. Well, and on that note right there, and I'm sorry, but it's, you, you went right into it, and that uh, cognitive stimulation, you talk about the physical exercise, but are we, are we talking about doing Sudoku or a Anything or like that. Reading a book, reading having a conversation, you know, doing something, try something new, like we said earlier. All those sorts of things are keeping your mind active. So sometimes you, the things, that you, not just personality and behavior, but people with uh, Alzheimer's or other dementias can develop depression. They can become socially isolated. They don't want to get out there and do anything, especially in the early stages, because they know what's going on. Most of the time, they're aware of it in that stage. They're going, well, I don't want to go out because I'm having these word finding difficulties and I feel like an idiot because I can't, I can't keep a conversation. Or I go out and I see somebody that I've seen for 20 years and I can't remember their name for 10 or 15 minutes. Then they become more depressed and then they just don't want to do anything. They become, less, they become more isolated and they stop doing these cognitively stimulating activities. So you've got to encourage that people to go, you know, these are our friends. These are, these are our family. They know what's going on. They know that's going to happen to you every now and again and that's okay. But we want you to continue to be around us and have the conversations and, and to do these activities that can really help in, in delaying the progression. As we progress in our age, there's, there's, a, there's a series of tests that, you know, that our doctor prescribes when we turn 40 as females and then when we turn, turn 50 as adults. So mm -hmm. I mean, there's a general battery of tests and you, know, you go to see your general practitioner and they do the EKG and mm -hmm. they say that for all of us. Um, at, and at what point in time will helping to prevent Alzheimer's, what point in time will, will, will the MRI or something like that be part of that battery of tests to be preventive medicine for all of us? If it's a good question. If these drugs on the market, right. these, these drugs on the market. So an MRI may, may never be initially one of those things way early on pre-symptomatic. What my hope is that uh, there's these PET scans with a new dye um, that, uh, a physician that I was working at at UVA, it's a dye that the University of Pittsburgh created. It was the one I was talking about that actually shows you the plaques and tangles. So the goal for the future is to that, that might, something like that would be beneficial to see if 20 years prior to symptomology coming or symptoms are coming on, we see these things, but you're still fine. Right. And then we have the drugs that will stop that from progressing. Right. Now, how far along well, down the line? Cholesterol now. I mean, right, yeah. So you're, you're, if you notice that you have predisposed having high cholesterol, you get on the medication to help keep it within normal levels. Well, these medications could help stop and block that from going any further. When or if that will happen, I have no idea. Uh, again, I don't think, uh, and again, I might not be the best person to ask about that, but an MRI as something uh, like that doesn't really seem warranted. It would be more for once you're having symptoms. Because there's people that I've diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease who, who seem unremarkable on MRI. But functionally, they fit the pattern completely. And vice versa. And we've known that from studies. They did a huge nun study where they, these nuns volunteered they're, they're, and they did autopsied their brains and they gave them these tests and things and there's a portion of them they found that just had Alzheimer's pathology all over the place but their cognition was fine and vice versa but that's that was atypical but it can happen okay so you know it's not a hundred percent science but you know right now the only hundred percent way of knowing that you have Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's disease pathology is to autopsy brains and we don't want to do that to people who are alive uh, so <laughs> Uh, but we really can tell based off the testing and off of imaging what's going on and how to best treat it. I was wondering if there are any uh, websites out there that you can see or in the brain alert. That's another interesting one and I'm going to try to make it quick. Uh, None of the websites out there, brain teas are not all great to be cognitively stimulating, but none of them have been shown proven in, in any of the research that I've shown is going to improve your memory or to, uh, uh, increase any, whatever activity it is, say you're doing, practicing memory tests or something. Well, you might get really good at that memory test, but that doesn't mean your overall memory functioning is getting better. But I do encourage them, and they are out there. Um, I actually have a whole list of them of like brain teasers and things like that that are free. But all you got to do is Google brain teaser and you're going to come up with a million hits. Also, 
Well, the FDA hasn't approved that. In fact, they just declined it, which was very unfortunate. Uh, but it's in the process of you know, becoming, it, and these things are, are, are down the line. These are new things that are just coming up. And uh, you know, the new drugs out there, the FDA takes time. I, I'm not going to speak. <laughs> the insurance companies pay me. I'm not going to. No, I, I understand your concern completely. And, and it is, it, it's tough because we have limitations on what we can do. Your insurance is different from your insurance and your insurance. Um, but yeah. So, for instance, if you have a family member with dementia, are there groups that get together uh, and do that? Right now, we don't. We don't have the staff for it, or we haven't. But we have considered it, uh, and that's something that uh, when we have more staff and, and the room to do it, uh, will be something that I, that I'd love to do. I used to participate in Parkinson's disease support groups, uh, MS support groups, and it's the same thing with any other unfortunate disease process. It affects not only them but the families, and it's very helpful. Yeah. So. Uh, So that's fantastic. I, you know, these are things. This is information that I'm trying to collect so that I can have that resource to give to other people uh, in our memory and aging care clinic. So I appreciate that. And uh, there are things out there. Are we considering it? Yes. Do we have it right now? Unfortunately, no. Okay. Excellent. I appreciate that information. I'll look into it. Absolutely. Reluctant. Uh, adamant that there's nothing wrong and angry and aggressive about right. it. How, do you have any advice? That's a tough situation because, uh, you know, one, you don't want to take anything away from them. Uh, two, there may be a process going on that's making them unaware of, of, of something more significant happening. And it sounds like this is a change, the anger and things like that. Or maybe an exacerbated previous yeah, personality that. trait. Um, so. Uh, Going about it in a different way, saying, you know, we're all concerned about you, or, you know, coming up in, in, in all about the wording usually helps. Uh, and it's saying, you know, well, prove us wrong then. You know, go in there and see this person and then just, you know, prove us wrong and let us know you're all right because we care about you. And, you know, if you could just show us that this nothing going on, uh, then we would feel a lot better. And then if it, things happen, then we can kind of have a different conversation. So I, it's, not, it's not a perfect science, and I know it's hard, especially when people are reluctant. But a part of this process, too, can be uninsightfulness and unaware of what's exactly going on. What is the definition of early onset? What would the age 